Hi guys, in this video we're going to recap dynamic equilibria, look at the decomposition of nitrogen tetroxide, look at homogeneous and heterogeneous reactions, the equilibrium constant, Kc, calculating the equilibrium constant, and finally we'll summarise. So you'll have met equilibrium before and dynamic equilibrium, but it's important to recap before we start talking about Kc. So what you've got to remember is that not all reactions happen in a one-way direction going to completion. So an example of one that does is here. When we burn methane, the methane combines with the oxygen to form water and carbon dioxide, and more or less all of the reactants are converted into products. But some processes have a reverse reaction which converts the products back to reactants. So if we look at the example of N2O4, we see that as N2O4 is converted in to NO2, then the NO2 is also being converted back into NO N2O4, and we get an equilibrium set up between the two. When the rate of the backward reaction and the forward reaction are the same, so that means when as much N2O4 is being converted into NO2, as is going the other way around, they're flowing at the same rates in both directions, the concentration of the products and the reactants remains constant. We're sending NO2 back into N2O4 as quickly as we're making it, so we have a dynamic equilibrium. So can we imagine a macroscopic dynamic equilibrium? Macroscopic just means it's on the kind of size scales in the real world. It's not microscopic. You can see it with your eyes. So let's imagine we've got this red bucket that's filled with yellow balls. And we're sending the yellow balls through some sort of colour changer. So just anything that changes the colour of these balls from yellow to green. And then we start putting the green balls in the blue bucket here. So now at a certain point, we decide to start sending the green balls back the other way. And then if the rates at which we're sending these balls forward and backward through this colour changer are equal, then the buckets will no longer appear to change. So if we're sending yellow balls through the colour changer this way at the same pace as we're sending green balls back the other way, then we will get a steady equilibrium where we have, for example, 40 balls in the red bucket and 60 balls in the blue bucket and we're taking balls out of the buckets at the same pace as we're putting them in so nothing changes. It's important to remember that nothing has stopped happening here. The balls are still being taken out and put into both the buckets. They're moving both ways but we have reached a point where no more changes happen to the buckets. This matches up to how in reversible reactions, the chemicals are still being exchanged both ways th through the reaction, but the products and the reactants remain at the same concentration. Now we've said how important it is to remember that the reactions continue happening in both ways, let's look at a chemical example of a reversible reaction. So dinitrogen tetroxide is a colourless gas that decomposes into nitrogen dioxide, a brown gas. So if we think about these stoppered flasks, the red shows that they're stoppered to keep the gases in. Then here we have the clear dinitrogen tetroxide, which has a chemical formula of N2O4, and it's decomposing into a brown gas, nitrogen dioxide, which has a formula of NO2. Now, as the nitrogen dioxide becomes more concentrated, it begins to combine back into dinitrogen tetroxide. It begins to go the other way. This is the condition we need to establish an equilibrium. So let's just take a look at how the equilibrium is established when dinitrogen tetroxide decomposes. We're going to look at these graphs which show how the concentration of each of the chemicals varies over time. Initially, we're going to be at point A on the graph at the beginning when there is no nitrogen dioxide. As you can see, the brown line for nitrogen dioxide is at zero concentration on the graph. And we have a high concentration of dinitrogen tetroxide, which is the blue line here. Because the dinitrogen tetroxide is colourless, we've got the beaker here, the, the conical flask, shown with a colourless gas in it. So now if we look slightly later in time, 
at point B on the graph, which we'll label as here, the reaction has taken place, well, the reaction has started to take place, that is, and the concentration of the N2O2 has fallen. The concentration of the nitrogen dioxide has increased from zero up to here. And because the nitrogen dioxide is brown, it's given the whole mixture the light brown colour you can see in the diagram here. If we now look later in time, when an equilibrium has been established, we'll look on the graph at this point in time, as you can see, this is just one point, we'll label C, and we've reached equilibrium. The concentrations of each of the chemicals no longer change. You can see how the lines have flattened out, so the concentration stays the same as time increases. The mixture has its darkest brown colour here, and the rate at which the dinitrogen tetroxide is decomposing into NO2 is the same at which the NO2 is recombining back, so there's no changes here. If we were to change any of the conditions, for example the pressure, then the equilibrium would need to be re-established. Remember Le Chatelier's principle from last year. If we increase the pressure, it would push the reaction towards the side with the least molecules of gas in it, which in this reaction doesn't matter so much, but it's those sort of things that can change the position of equilibrium. So in the example we just looked at, the decomposition of dinitrogen tetroxide, only gases were involved. And we call reactions where all the reactants and products are the same, uh, they're in the same state that is, so they're all either gases or they're either liquids, we call that a homogeneous reaction. Another example is the reaction between iodine gas and hydrogen shown here. So the hydrogen's a gas, the iodine's a gas, and it forms the hydrogen iodide, which is also a gas. So a homogeneous equilibrium is one where all the chemicals involved are in the same state. Now let's contrast this with reactions where there are different states of matter present. So for example, if we've got water in its gas form becoming water in its liquid form, and obviously it will be going back the other way as well and will have formed an equilibrium, this is called a heterogeneous equilibrium. More than one state of matter is present. So you should remember from last year's work being introduced to the equilibrium constant Kc. We're going to look here how heterogeneous reactions fit in to this equilibrium constant, how the different states of matter affect it. So consider the general representation for an equilibrium reaction. We've got species A, capital A and capital B, becoming species capital C and capital D. The number of moles we've got of each is represented by the lowercase letters. So we've got small a moles of A, small b moles of B, and so on. The equilibrium law states that the equilibrium constant, Kc, is calculated from this expression here. You take the product, the concentration of the products on the top, multiply them together and raise them to the power of how many moles there are. So the concentration of species C raised to how many moles of C there are, and so on for the products divided through by the reactants. And so if the reaction has progressed very far towards the products, we're going to get a high value of Kc. And if the reaction has not progressed very far, we have a high concentration of the reactants, then we'll get a low value of Kc. We'll talk about that more in a future video. So a heterogeneous reaction where solids or pure liquids are present, we note that the concentration of the solid and the pure liquid doesn't change. It's always effectively a 100% concentration of that solid. If everything is pure, we're always at 100% concentration. So because the concentration of the solids and pure liquids doesn't change, we do not need to include the solids or pure liquids in the expression for Kc. Let's have a look at a quick example of this. So in this reaction, we have solid white phosphorus, so we're not going to include that in the equilibrium constant expression, reacting with oxygen, which is a gas, so this will have a concentration, forming another solid P4O10, which again will not be included. So if we look at the expression for Kc, there are no products that we want to include on the top, so we just do one over 
all of the reactants that have a concentration, so that's the concentration of the oxygen raised to the power of five, because five molecules are present. So if we want to calculate the units of Kc, we replace the terms in the expression with their units. So in this example above, we would have that Kc is equal to one divided by the units of the concentration of oxygen, which is moles per decimeter cubed, and then that is raised to the power of a five on the bottom. So if we then expand this out, we get one over moles to the five and decimeters to the minus 15, because you've got the five times the minus three. And then if we put this back on the top, you would get final units of decimeters to the 15 moles to the minus five. So this is the same sort of process we saw with the rate constant. Now we've met the expression for the equilibrium constant again. Let's go through a simple example together so we know how to calculate it. So we've got SO2 and oxygen mixed in a sealed conical flask and it tells us the volume is three decimeters cubed. It then gives us the equation for this reaction. So two moles of the SO2 combine with one mole of oxygen to form two moles of SO3. At equilibrium, it then gives us the amount of moles present of each of the species and asks us to work out the equilibrium constant and the units. Remember, to work out the equilibrium constant, we need more than the moles, we need the concentrations of these. But if we know the amount of moles and we know the total volume, we can find the concentrations ourselves. Remember that concentration is equal to moles divided by the volume. So if we put that in for all of our chemicals above, we find that the concentration of the SO3 is equal to 0.83 moles divided by the volume of our flask, which is three decimeters cubed. And then that gives us a final answer for the concentration of 0.12 moles per decimeter cubed. So then if we work out the same using the sorry using the same method, if we work out the concentration of oxygen, we have that the concentration of O2 is equal to 0.1 moles divided by three decimeter cubed, and that gives us a value of 0.04 moles per decimeter cubed. And sorry, just to make a quick correction above, as you may have noticed, it should be 0.28 moles per decimeter cubed for this calculation, not 0.12. And then if we work out the final concentration in the same method for the SO2, we find that 0.36 moles divided by three decimeter cubed is equal to 0.12 moles per decimeter cubed. So now, if we write out our expression for Kc, uh, just in terms of the concentrations, we see that, again, Kc will be equal to the products on the top. So the product in our reaction, if we look up here in blue, is the SO3. So SO3, the concentration, raised to the power of two, because there are two moles of it, divided through by the concentration of the reactants. So we have SO2 raised to the power of two because there are two moles of it, and oxygen just raised to the power of one, which we don't actually need to write because there's one mole of oxygen. Now, if we put in the numbers for this, we'll see that we have 0.28 moles per decimeter cubed squared for the SO3, and then if we put in our reactants, we have 0.12 moles per decimeter cubed of the SO2, and then we have 0.04 moles per decimeter cubed of the oxygen. If we put those numbers through our calculator, we find that the numerical answer for Kc is 136 to three significant figures. So now let's work out the units. We'll take the units from our expression before, and then we'll expand them out so we have moles squared on the top uh, decimeters to the minus six. And then on the bottom, we have moles cubed. So that comes from moles squared here plus another moles here. So that's moles three. And then we have 
decimeters to the minus six from this bracket plus another minus three from this bracket gives decimeters to the minus nine. So if we include all of this together, we have two minus three to give us a final answer. Moles to the minus one, and then we have decimeters to the minus six, minus decimeters to the minus nine. So that gives us decimeters cubed on the top. And the units of Kc are decimeters cubed moles to the minus one. So we write that out as our final answer of 136 decimeters cubed moles to the minus one. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level chemistry resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revised smiley face and together let's make A-level chemistry a walk in the park.